just so you know, that's the most exciting part of my day. Recording or the countdown? The countdown. As long as you record something. Are you on Facebook right now? No. Just so you know, there's no answers on Facebook. Would you trust the answers of people that would give you on Facebook? That's all right. Here we go. Okay. Hang on, hang on. Here we go. Okay. Got to give you a little vocabulary today, people. Okay? Are you ready? Cuz when you when you guys read stuff, I know what you do. You read this word oxidation and you're like I have no idea what that means. Maybe it won't show up again. Just keep going. Ain't that about the size of it? Okay, here we go. Watch. Hang on, hang on. Okay, ready? What holds chemical compounds together? Right. What, what is it? No, uh, that's a bad question. No, that's a bad question. I've got to give you a better question. Then you'll get a better answer, maybe. What is it in the atom that allows atoms to form chemical bonds? That's very good. What? Electrons. Say yes. yes. Write this down. I'm not. Electrons have energy in them. Did you know that? Watch. That's how a microwave works. M a microwave sends microwaves to molecules and causes them to vibrate. And when they vibrate, they produce heat. That's how you warm up your chicken pot pie. Okay. Are you ready? Okay, watch. Oxidation. Yep, I spelled it right. Oxidation. Right, now I'm going to help you because I like you guys as far as you know. Oxidation has nothing to do with oxygen. I'm going to ask you the definition of oxidation, and you're not going to mention oxygen. What's the definition of oxidation? That's so close. Write this down, never forget it. Oxidation is removing electrons. Say so, yeah. And when you remove electrons from a compound, watch it. What holds this together? Say the other one. Yeah, watch. When you, watch it, when you break this chemical bond by removing electrons, say yes, yes, and you always remove two electrons at a time, you break that chemical bond. Tell me you got me. You're with me. So oxidation is the process of removing <laughs> electrons from a compound and breaking the chemical bond. How many people have heard of antioxidants? Good. You know what antioxidants are? Antioxidants catch free-floating electrons. Free-floating electrons are bad for you. They will kill you. 
They're called, you ever hear of oxy radicals? Oxy radicals cause cell damage. Antioxidants catch free floating electrons. That's why if you take antioxidants, you live longer. I'm 92 years old and I only look 70. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Say, yeah, where are you going? Okay, well, good luck. Remember, homeostasis. Who, who, who's with me so far? What does oxidation mean? Removing electrons, and when you remove electrons, what do you do? You break the chemical bond. Say yes. Okay, these electrons that are released have energy in them. Say yes. And the whole purpose, the whole purpose of you eating, you better get this. That says adenosine. What's this? Say yeah. One Z, two Z, tri Z. You got me? This is a molecule of adenosine triphosphate. You got me? This is the only source of energy a cell can use. If a cell needs energy, where does it get it from? It gets it from ATP. Say yes, TP. And watch, watch. We learned, I'll never forget it. We learned that the sodium potassium pump requires energy. Where does the sodium potassium pump get the energy from? ATP. How do you use ATP? I'm going to explain it to you. Ready? When a cell needs energy, it hacks off that third phosphate. And when you break chemical bonds, you release energy. And that energy, watch it, allows molecules like amino acids. Who's with me? To come closer together. And when they come close together, they form chemical bonds. Say yes. So is that how proteins are made? Yes. Yes. Anytime you make a chemical bond, what does it require? Energy. And where do you get that energy from? Breaking off that third phosphate. Say yeah. Are we a perfect system? No. no. Well, some people like to think they are. Oh, yeah. Did I tell you? A couple years ago, a student came in. She had this really, like, kind of teased look on her face like she was upset. So I said, what's wrong with you? And she goes, I'm hot. And I go, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. <laughs> but Nina, I'd leave too after that one. <laughs> Watch. Watch. We're about 70% efficient. When we break off that third phosphate, about 70% of that energy is released in energy that moves molecules around. The other 30% is lost as heat. True or false, it takes ATP to contract muscle. True. So if you contract more muscle, yeah? You use more ATP. So not only do you make create more energy, but you also create more heat. 
That's why you get how will you exercise. Say yeah. Okay. Who's following this so far? Guys? Okay. Watch. When you break off that third phosphate to release energy, what's left over is adenosine 1z, 2z. You got me? One, die, dice. Jimmy needs a new pair of shoes. You got me? What's left over is adenosine diphosphate with a little lonely phosphate hanging out. Who's following this? Guys? What the hell happened here? Who's with me? Why is that lonely phosphate? It just got hacked off. Boom. You broke that bond there. Oh. Right? So it's just hanging out. By itself. So you have ADP left over. So plus the PO4. Right, it's just hanging there. Just kind of wishing it was in the group. Who's with me? Guys? Guys? Watch. Where do you get the energy? to reattach that third phosphate. Food. You eat food that carbs, fats, or amino acids get into the cell. Listen up, because this is true. Enzymes inside the cell break the chemical bonds, and when you break the chemical bonds, what do you release? Energy, Energy in the form of no. electrons. electrons. Say yes. Yeah. Those electrons that are released when you break the chemical bonds of the food that you ate are captured and harvested. Who's with me? And created into energy to take that little lonely phosphate that's all by itself oh yeah, oh yeah and reattach it to ADP to resynthesize ATP Does it always go back to the same adenosine diphosphate or does it matter which one it goes back to that one or the phosphate? No, it's always going to go back to ADP You got me? That's the circle of life. Yeah. Tell me you got that. Now watch, watch, watch. Where do you get the energy to pop on that third phosphate to ADP? Food. Food. So watch, watch. If you exercise more, run, forest, run. You're using more ATP, yes? yes. So the food that you ate now is broken down in the cells of your body, your muscle cells, to reattach that third phosphate. Say yes. So the more ATP you use, the more food you can eat. Say yeah. Now watch and listen up, because this is true. If you eat more food than is required, to recycle ADP into ATP? Say yes. Deliver takes any of that extra stuff and converts it to fat and you get tubby. And here's the potential bad part. You don't make no never mind what you eat. It's how much of what you eat. Do you understand that? Deliver can take carbs and amino acids in excess and convert them to fat. So if you drink Joe Weider protein shakes all damn day, if you drink enough of those things, you will get tubby. 
That's why, watch. People, it just, it irritates me because I didn't think of it. My buddy used to always say, I'd always say, like, why are there so many stupid people in the world? And he goes, Tim, don't get mad that there's a lot of stupid people in the world. Take advantage of them. <laughs> so all these 2 a.m. diets, I'm on the liposome diet. I'm on the ketogenic diet. I'm on the textbook reading diet. <laughs> Clearly none of you guys are on that. <laughs> They take advantage of people's ignorance. Do you understand? You ain't going to be ignorant no more. Watch. Ignorance is you don't know. No one's explained it to you. Stupid is people explain it to you over and over again and you still don't get Now nah, you're stupid. Say yeah. And watch. Look. I'm a victim of it too. I watch this 3 o'clock in the morning. They got this thing on... The tornado. It's a thing you put in your carburetor and it's supposed to increase your engine efficiency and horsepower. I'm like, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I pull out my credit card cell phone. Oh, give me one of those. Then I take it to my mechanic and it's like a little, you know, aluminum thing. And he goes, what the hell is that? I go, dude, that's a tornado. <laughs> And he grabs it and crumples it up. He goes, it's ridiculous. It doesn't work. Then he explains to me why. And I'm like, that makes sense. If you don't, you don't know what you don't watch, if you've got a little belly and you do sit-ups, you can reduce the fat off your belly. Right? Sounds like work. Amen. Can you... If you've got a belly, can you do sit-ups? And the fat on your belly will go away. Is there a ratio of it? Of how much work you need to get that fat away? A ratio of work per fat? Or Watch. Can you spot reduce? No. no. Watch. Your body loses weight like an ice cube melts. When it melts, it melts all over. And people say, the first fat on is the last fat to go. And that's right, because there's more of it. <laughs> oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and watch, listen up, because this is a sad fact. Women have an enzyme in their fat cells called lipoprotein lipase. It's seven times more active in women than men. Women are forced to store fat. They are. Why? Back in the day when Og and Thug, right? They had the they were living in the cave. They the guy had to go out and hunt for Brontosaurus. Say yeah. And the woman stayed home and nursed the kids. Uh -huh. You know, I'm watch Maury. Watch. And this is a fact, right? Exercise in men decreases their appetite. Exercise in women increases their appetite. Because the body does stuff that makes sense. If the woman's running around, right, she's losing fat, and they don't want that to happen. Because you need fat to make breast milk. Say yeah. yeah. So that's why appetite goes up in women. Tell me if I'll die. So yeah, I got to tell you, this is just a personal reflection. You guys got it rough, man. I mean, you do. You bleed once a month. Then you got all the hormone things going on. I'm like, that's got to be rough. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, being a guy is pretty easy, you know. If you have a remote, you know, some beer and some food, you're pretty straight. Yeah, and watch MTV. Um, guys, <laughs> how many people followed this? For real. Here's the other thing, and I'm not sure a lot of you know, and I'm going to say this again. 
it don't make no never mind what you eat. It's how much of what you eat, right? Everything, every nutrient, carbs, fats, amino acids in excess will get converted to fat in the liver and store in fat cells. Say, yeah, you got that. All right, so watch. What's oxidation? Removing electrons and breaking chemical bonds. What's phosphorylation? Phosphorylation. Removing a phosphate. That's so close. Adding a phosphate. Is that what you said? Yeah. Why don't you say it loud? I'm sorry, I forgot you died. Right. <laughs> Hawaii just sent me a letter. I can't go there and hear anything. Guys, phosphorylation is adding a phosphate. What do you think I am? Webster's Dictionary? What's wrong with you? You got a Google. You probably got a smartphone and, oh, you got an Apple Watch too. I'm not spelling it. Well, I guess I was schooled, huh? I got this. That's one word I can spell. I stay up late at night. Foss. Wait. Foss. Four. <laughs> There's no way I'm getting. I got this. Phosphorylation. Did you guys read chapter four like I requested? Oh, okay. Yeah. You just poured over that thing. The metabolic pathway is a process of oxidative phosphorylation. So Timmy gonna simplify it. It's taking the food that you eat, carbs, fats, amino acids, getting it into the cell, breaking the chemical bonds that hold those carbs, fats, amino acids together, removing electrons, capturing those electrons, and then converting those captured electrons into energy that will take ADP floating around the cell and pop on the third phosphate. That's oxidative phosphorylation. Right, right. Did, did you look at the metabolic pathway? Did you look at that? Right. It's insane. Here we go. How many people got that? Guys, what's the whole purpose of why we eat, why we're supposed to eat? Not because you're hungry. It's to break the bonds in the food that we eat, to take the third lonely phosphate, pop it back on, and regenerate ADP into ATP. Say yes. Guys, yes or no? And you went over this in general to some degree, right? You know what ATP is, right? Please, God. <laughs> All right. So, again, what's oxidation? That's very good, right? And when you remove electrons, you produce what? Energy. You produce energy from those electrons. Say, yeah. Okay. Watch. Can people spontaneously combust? Aunt Bessie, she was watching uh, All My Children on the Lifetime channel, and then all of a sudden she just started on fire, and she just burnt to a crisp. Can people spontaneously combust? No. Why not? Huh? Because you need the thing to make it start by fire. You have the stuff that burns. You have glucose, fat, amino acids. Say yes. Right. The trigger is breaking the chemical bonds. And when you break chemical bonds, you release electrons, and some of that is in the form of heat, that energy that's released. That's why, watch. If you're cold, right? That's cold. 
and you eat food, when you start digesting the food and breaking the bonds of that steak that you just ate, it produces heat. That's why you feel warm after you eat. Uh, that, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I told you I had a buddy that would sweat when he ate, right? Me and my other buddy, we'd go out to dinner, right? And we would have bets on how long it would take him to start sweating. <laughs> and this guy would, it, that's what would pour off this dude. And then where is it? He would have a pile of napkins as he was eating. And then he would just grab a napkin and just dab his forehead. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, this is really off the subject, but it made me think of this, too. You ever get the piss shivers? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like you begin to shiver when you pee. You've never, no, you've never experienced that. You've had it, right? Usually after I waited for a long time. Right. Yes. Now watch. Watch. The goal of the body is to maintain homeostasis, right? Yeah. And the goal of our body temperature is 98.6, right? Now watch. In the wintertime, it is warmer by the lake, and in the summertime, it's cooler by the lake. That's because water takes on heat slowly and gives up heat slowly. That's why when you go out in the freezy cold, right, it's 20 below because you're, you've got a lot of water in you. That's why you, when you walk out, you don't freeze. <laughs> That's because the body water, the blood, gives off heat slowly and then takes on heat slowly. That's why you can go out into a 110 degree temperature and still be okay. Tell me you got that. So... When you pee, and especially when you pee a lot, like in the morning sometimes, right? You pee a lot, and because that urine is 98.6, you are removing a lot of that warm water. So your body temperature will actually begin to drop, and then you will shiver to try to get your body temperature back up. That's why you get the piss shivers. Okay, but can we combust? No. You never answered why. why? Yeah, why? Why can't we combust? Why? Why? Do you know how they figure out how many calories are in like a Whack Dougal's burger? Do you know how they do that? No. They put it in what's called a bomb calorimeter and they burn that Whack Dougal's burger. You got me? And how much heat it creates when you burn it is converted into calories. You, you knew that, right? No? Well, that's how they do it. Now, watch, watch. When you burn a piece of wood, you're burning that wood, all of it. Tell me you got that. Because you're breaking all the chemical bonds in that wood, it creates heat and fire. Say yes. When glucose gets into the cell, do we break all the chemical bonds at once? No. It is systematic. And slowly, so when you dissipate, you, when you break those bonds and produce that heat, the heat is produced slowly. That's why you can't come spontaneously combust. So when it's in the Inquirer, believe it, every word of it. Yeah? Do you guys believe that stuff in the Inquirer? Yeah. Here we go. Ready, guys? Okay, watch, write this down. Never go on a diet, because the first three letters of the word diet are die. <laughs> it's a lifestyle change, do you understand? No one, look, can you eat like seaweed forever? Can you? And watch, some of those diets are insane. The ketogenic diet, you know what I'm talking about? I'm going to explain that. 
That stuff is, that is bad for you. Well, if you need, if you're diabetic, but if you want to lose some weight, right? Get off your fatty ass and run around the block a couple of times. Or better yet, lift up that heavy textbook and turn the real thick, heavy pages. <laughs> Say yeah. And watch. <laughs> and I love people. that stuff yet do a little exercise that's all you got to do get off your fatty acid and do something why does the keto diet cause cholesterol um the keto diet dumps cholesterol into the bile and the bile um that excess cholesterol will sequester and form stones that's why women are at greater risk for the development of gallstones than men because they dump more cholesterol into their bile Uh, well, watch. You need protein, right? You need to make albumin. We talked about this. So what will happen is that person, the body will start cannibalizing muscle protein. That's why when you go on these really caloric restricted diets, you start getting weak because the body does stuff that makes sense. And if it ain't got enough albumin to make proteins and enzymes and stuff, it will start cannibalizing muscle. It's the only way it could be. Why is it when people get sick, they don't like to eat meat? Like in the elderly, it's really hard to get them to eat meat to make the albumin. Like they don't like to, I don't know, something about meat that they don't They can't eat. chew it. They ain't got no tephises. <laughs> right, but some of them do. But it's really hard to get the meat in them, you know? I don't know. I don't like know. Eat the other stuff, but that, you know, and think about protein, albumin. That's yeah, when you get older, you naturally lose weight because your taste buds aren't as sensitive. Food doesn't taste as good. And one of the things that people love doing is the taste of food, mm -hmm. right? The other thing is chewing food, right? Can you, have, can you imagine drinking a pureed T-bone steak? Just the thought of that is nauseating. The act of chewing, there's pleasure in that, right? And here's the other thing. You ever see Americans eat? It's like a freaking contest, <laughs> right? They're just shoveling it in. Where in other countries, meals are events, right? And they eat slowly, and there's something to be said for that. And most of the people from other cultures and other countries, they eat well. They don't eat all this processed garbage, right? And it all is garbage. You know, do you, watch, my grandpa lived to be 96. And he smoked camel filterless cigarettes. And his fingers were all yellow, his mustache was always yellow. And he died of emphysema at 96. Wow. And his, my, his, my grandma during the Depression would make him homemade bread, put bacon grease in it, and that's what he'd eat for lunch. Yeah. So watch. People were, I'm on cholesterol. Get off your fatty acid and move. God gave you two arms and legs to use it. And what do people do? I'm just saying, and watch. There's three things that kill people. Four, really. Lack of sleep, stress, and lack of physical activity. The fourth one, obviously, is not reading the textbook. Right? You want to die, don't get enough sleep, get stressed, and sit on your fatty acid. 
you'll be taking a six foot dirt nap in no time. And that's a fact. Okay, guys, watch. Here we go. Quiz time. Watch. These carbs, fats, and amino acids are not energy. They're fuel. Just like gasoline is a fuel. It gets into the carburetor, the spark plug ignites the gas, and it explodes and moves your piston. Tell me you got that. So these are fuels, and they're used ultimately to create energy inside the cell. Taking a third phosphate, popping it on ADP and making ATP say yes. Which fuel do you use the most of inside your cells to make energy? No. Of these three potential fuels, which one are you using the most of right now inside your cells? Each. What did you say? The fuel that's most readily available. No, it isn't. It was a great question. Watch. Listen. Watch. Watch. If you eat a bunch of those candy dots, do they still make them? Yeah. With the strip of paper? Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. I had a dream the other night that I ate a Butterfinger. It was like this long. Wow. And then it was like my jaw got stuck together. You know, you eat a Butterfinger, you can eat that thing for two weeks. Like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> you know I'm right, right? Okay, so watch. If you eat a bunch of sugar, what's going to happen to your blood sugar? What do you want to happen to your blood sugar? What do you, if your blood sugar is up, what do you want to do with your blood sugar? Bring it down. Bring it down. Tell me you got that. So insulin is going to bind the receptor, open up the gate, and glucose will go from high concentration of blood, low concentration in the cell. So when your blood sugar is high and you got insulin, <coughs> What fuel are you going to be using to make ATP inside your cells? Glucose, because it's the most readily available. And what makes it the most readily available? Insulin. Say yes. yes. Watch. You decide, I need to study. And you study and read the textbook for two days straight. You don't pee or nothing. What's going to happen to your blood sugar? It will go down. And when your blood sugar's down, you don't have insulin around. That rhymes. Mm -hmm. Guys, and if you don't have insulin around, can you use glucose for fuel? No. no. Then what becomes the most readily available fuel? Fat does. Tell me you got that. Okay? Watch. Right, if you don't know, if you don't eat, you lose weight. I'm going to cover that, I swear to you. Watch. I have a fireplace in my house, and I have a stack of wood there. Would it make sense for me to go up to my attic, take my saws off, and cut down the rafters of my house and burn that in my fireplace? What's that? You did, you, you, you did way too much thinking there. <laughs> what do you need amino acids for? To build protein. Structural and functional proteins. Say yes. So would it make sense if you need amino acids to make protein to break these chemical bonds inside your cell to make energy? Would that make sense? 
the rafters example? Would that make sense? Yeah. Good. So only in rare instances are amino acids used to make energy inside your cells. The two fuels that are used the most are glucose and fat. And you always use the fuel that's most readily available. Say yes. And what determines the fuel that's most readily available? Insulin. Yes or no? <coughs> Tell me you got that. Guys? Do you, do you follow this? All right. So watch. What I'm going to do. You know what? Uh, do me a favor. Take a break. All right. And then I'm, I'm just going to go over the functions of insulin. And then I'm going to go. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the metabolic pathway. Listen up because this is true. I'm telling you right now that you need to, after quiz number one, you need to start getting on quiz number two. There are videos and I'm going to show you the ones that you need to watch. And you need to become familiar with those and start studying. Say yeah, because in class I'm going to be going over stuff, and if you don't watch those videos, you will be lost. And you don't want to be lost, you want to be found. Say yeah. yeah. All right, take a break. Ready? <laughs> Students always say, always say to me, Tim, why, why, do you have to, why do you have to be all doom and gloom? I said, I'm not doom and gloom. I'm telling you the truth. Do you understand that? If I come in here and say, look, don't worry about it. Just treat this class like sociology. And then you get a negative 12% on your, like, what the hell's going on? So if I don't push you, are you really going to push yourself? Are you really going to push yourself? No. You're going to do enough to get by. So decide. Say, yeah. What? Yeah, that's right. Here we go. I'm going over the functions of insulin. I want all of this. There's a video on Timmy YouTube videos, Tanya. Guess what it's called? The functions of insulin. Say yeah. Watch. We know one function, don't we? When is insulin released? Right. In response to elevated blood sugar. Say yes. yes. I want this. There are specific cells that release insulin from the pancreas. They're called beta cells. Not beta receptors, beta cells. Say yeah. yeah. So what cells release insulin? Beta cells. Beta cells. That's right. Who's with me? Guys? All right. So when your blood sugar's high, you want insulin. What up, G? On quiz number two, if you put what up, G, I'll give you extra credit. Who's following me? Insulin gets released into the blood, and in order for insulin to exert its effect, what does it have to do? It has to bind with an insulin receptor on the cell membrane. And when it does that, whoops, it opens up that little glucose gate and allows glucose to go from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the cell. Say yes. yes. That's function number one. All right. Watch, just so you know this abbreviation. So if we draw that picture like that, we're okay, right? If you draw it and you don't explain it, oh. I'm marking your life wrong. A two-year-old can draw this picture, probably better. Yeah? Yeah. So the receptor on the cell is the insulin receptor, right? Correct. Boom. Who's with me? All right. This little symbol here is triglyceride. Are you with me? Watch. This is how fat 
is transported in the blood. Fat is transported in the blood in the form of triglyceride. Are you following me? And triglyceride is made up of a three carbon compound called, wait, how do you spell it? Oh, got it. Glycerol, and hanging off of it are carbon chains called fatty acids. One, two, triglycerol, triglyceride. Say yeah. Write this down, very important. These are fatty acids. And fatty acids always, always, always come in even numbered carbon chains. Watch it. This is a fatty acid. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten's an even number. Say yes. So fatty acids come in 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20 carbon chains long. And on Labor Day and 4th of July, they come in a 30 pack. Say yeah. And what is every even number divisible by? That's very important that you remember that. Say yeah. All right, so watch. Do you eat fat? Yes. Sure. I had a can of lard last night. Watch. You're going to eat glucose and fat. What's going to happen to your triglyceride level in your blood? It's going to go up. But if your blood sugar's up, what fuel do you want to use to make ATP inside those cells? Not insulin. What fuel? You want to use glucose because what's the only fuel the brain can use? And when does your brain work best? 80 to 100, right? So if your blood sugar's high and insulin's around, you're going to use glucose to get into the cells to break it apart and make ATP. Are you following? To guarantee that, I want this to guarantee that glucose is the most readily available fuel for the cells to use, insulin performs its second function. And insulin will take any fat that's in the bloodstream and put it into fat cells. Any fat, triglyceride, that's in the bloodstream and it will lock it up in a fat cell. What's in a fat cell? Fat. Say, yeah. Uh, Basically, fat cells are nothing more than like, you ever see like a, um, like a wasp nest, the little holes in there, right? You are born with a certain number of fat cells. You got me? Fat cells can expand limitlessly. You can be as fat as you want to be. So if you have a limited number of fat cells, all you do is make the fat cells you got soar more fat. That's it. Tell me you got that. What's another function of insulin? Another function of insulin is take triglyceride that's in the blood and put it into fat cells. If it's locked up in a fat cell, can it be used in this cell to make ATP? No. That guarantees that glucose is going to be the most readily available fuel. Say yes. So the second function of insulin is to take triglyceride that's in the blood and put it into a fat cell. The third function of insulin 
is any triglyceride that's already in there, insulin locks it up. Do you understand that? So fat triglyceride gets trapped in a fat cell. And if it's locked up in a fat cell, it can't be used to make ATP inside the cell. That guarantees that glucose is going to be the most readily available fuel, say yes. That's an inquisitive look. Watch, I'll explain. I'll explain. The second function is it takes triglyceride from the blood and puts it into a fat cell. The third function is any fat that's already in the fat cell, it locks it up. Say yes. Yes, locks it up. You got me? Watch. So it's making sure that if it's already in there, it's staying in there. It's staying in there. Insulin locks up fat in a fat cell. That's why I watch. If you eat a bunch of sugar and you got a lot of insulin around, what does insulin do to fat in a fat cell? Locks it up. So can you use lose fat if you got a lot of insulin around? That's how the ketogenic diet works. You don't need any glucose. So if you don't need any glucose, do you have insulin? More on that later. The keto flu? Yeah. Like the hell is that? When you start it, you like feel like crap, you feel like headache. Oh yeah, I'll explain that. Okay. Yep. That's what it's called, the keto flu. Never heard of it. Never heard. That must be like a two thousand term. <laughs> I don't know. My whole family's doing it, so I hear all about their stupid keto flu all the time. Great. It usually lasts about a week. The ketogenic uh, flu. I'm going to use that. I'm not even going to give you any credit. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> I ain't hating. Just stating. Ready? Watch. How many functions of insulin we got so far? Yep. The other function of insulin is to allow amino acids into the cell. Do you use amino acids to break them apart to make ATP inside your cell? Do you routinely? No. You use amino acids to build what? Protein. Protein. You better write this down. Any hormone, insulin's a hormone that builds protein, is summon up, is anabolic. What the? Any hormone that builds protein is anabolic. Does insulin build protein? Say yes. It allows amino acids into the cell to build protein. Okay. So is insulin anabolic? Yes. Bodybuilders like myself. I know, you can laugh. That's okay. Bodybuilders will take insulin while they're training. They'll go over to grandma's house, hey grandma, look, there's a spider, and then steal her insulin. <laughs> and when you inject the insulin, that will allow more amino acids into muscle cells to build muscle. So insulin builds muscle. It's anabolic. It builds muscle and it makes you gain weight? Yep. Between fat and? Yep. Oh, that's kind of the devil. Yeah. That's why if you read the textbook, it decreases your appetite. So what's the fourth function of insulin? Allow amino Allows amino acids into the cell. And if you have amino acids into the cell, what can you build? Protein. protein. So any hormone that builds protein is anabolic. anabolic. Say yes. So does the amino acids have like a special pump that they go through, or do they just diffuse? D they diffuse. Well, I take that back. There's carriers in there. Yeah. You've heard of L-carnitine? Don't worry about it. All you need to know is they go from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the cell. Say, yeah. Okay. How many functions we got? Four. Four.
the other function of insulin, you better write this down, very important. Insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump. Insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump. Anybody work in an emergency room here? You do? Okay, watch. Watch. What does the pump do? Please get this right and listen up. When you write down the quiz, the sodium potassium pump, Every time you write the sodium potassium pump, you're going to tell me what it pumps, how much, and where. Say yes. Yes. What does the sodium potassium pump pump? Sodium I'm going to write that down. How much potassium does it pump, and where? Two. It takes two potassiums that leaked into the blood and pumps them back into the cell, and it takes what? Three. Three what? that leaked into the cell and pumps them back into the, and what does that require? Because you're working against the concentration gradient? ATP. ATP. And where do you get the ATP from? And taking the food that you ate and breaking the chemical bonds, releasing electrons, and converting that ADP and popping on a third phosphate to ATP, say us. Yes. So watch, you work in an emergency room. I'm talking here. Don't write this down later. If your potassium level is high, the treatment for it is insulin and glucose. If your, is if your potassium level is high in the blood, the treatment is insulin and glucose. Because it pumps the potassium into the cell and you give them glucose so their blood sugar doesn't bottom out. Did you follow that even remotely? If somebody's blood level of potassium is high, the treatment is to get them insulin and glucose. What does insulin do? It stimulates the sodium potassium pump. Where's the potassium high? In the blood. What does the pump do? It pumps that potassium in the cell. Tell me you got that. That will come back and bite you royally in the fatty acid. They love having NCLEX questions like that. They just do. Hang on. Um, WebND. What is it? Well, that's a bad one. Hang on. Anybody see it? Wait, some of them. Either my mom took too much um, potassium, had to be dialysis, they shut for a kidney transplant into shock. And then they had to get her kidney going again. There we go. The treatment for hyperkalemia, high potassium in the blood, is. Where is it? There. Stimulate Factors such as insulin and cat, which stimulate the activity of the sodium potassium pump, pumping the. Potassium into the cell. You got me? All right. How many functions of insulin did I give you? Five. Five. What organ manufactures cholesterol? The liver. Insulin, you better write this down. This is a liver cell. How do you know? I wrote liver cell. The liver cell produces cholesterol and dumps it into the blood. Insulin 
inhibits the production. Whoa! Insulin inhibits the production of cholesterol in the liver. Do you know anybody who's a diabetic, type 1 or type 2? You know anybody? I will be willing to bet about 12 cents that they're on some type of drug that prevents the liver from manufacturing cholesterol and dumping it into the blood. Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor. Say yeah? There you go. Tell me you got that. How many functions? The final function, conjunction, junction. What's your function? Do you remember that? The final function is insulin promotes textbook reading. Insulin promotes healing. There you go. There you go. <laughs> How thick is it? Capillary. People who are diabetic, type 1 or type 2, with insulin and glucose being a problem, just listen to this. What happens to the capillary membrane is it actually becomes thickened. Are you following me? Now watch. What's this? Mm -mm. It's a white blood See, I made it white. White blood cells have the ability to squeeze through small cracks in the capillary and get into the interstitial space. You learn this in general. So this is B for bacteria. That white blood cell can squeeze through that normal capillary and eat up that bacteria. In people with diabetes, that capillary membrane becomes thickened and white blood cells can't squeeze through it. Yeah, not even uncontrolled. It's a natural process of the disease. Even if you care, if you control your blood sugar really, really good, it will take longer for that process to happen. But if you live long enough as a diabetic, it happens to all diabetics. And there's no treatment for that? No. Well, there is treatment. It's prevention. So the other thing that diabetics develop is neuropathy. The nerves become destroyed, mm -hmm. right? So if diabetics start, get, start getting numbness and tingling and pain in their feet, that is the beginning signs of neuropathy. Ultimately, those nerves become completely damaged and they lose all sensation. That's why diabetics are told to watch their feet every day because if you're walking around, all right, okay, I'm not going to read the textbook, and you bang your foot and you don't feel it because you got neuropathy, then when you go home at night, you take it off and you got a pile of goo there. Let's say, yeah. Yeah. So, insulin promotes healing. There's other things involved in it, but that's why diabetics, you don't die from diabetic ketoacidosis anymore because we got insulin, right? And other oral drugs. What they do die from are the effects of diabetes. And the big effect of diabetes is microvascular disease. Small blood vessels getting jacked up. Say yeah. So here, let me just show you this real quick. That's a diabetic foot ulcer. So is that from them hitting it or not hitting it, it, they're doing it? 
Right, it's infection and poor blood supply to the extremities. The result is, is that, and those white blood cells can't squeeze through that thickened capillary membrane, so the bacteria win and your foot gets rot, rots off. When I was down in Dallas, there was a guy, uh, it was a brittle diabetic. You know what a brittle diabetic is? One minute your blood sugar is 60, the next minute it's 600. So, I gotta remember this. He lost one leg above the knee, one leg below the knee, and one arm above the elbow. Wow. Right? And he was going blind. So I see him laying on a gurney, right? I remember his first name, Joe. I go, Joe, what the hell are you doing here? Oh, I'm having surgery. I'm like, for what? Oh, I'm getting one of them, their uh, penile implants. Now here's a guy with no legs and one arm, and he's getting some. Oh my God. Can I tell you? Watch. You are not a guy. When that thing don't work anymore, you sold the farm. Life is over. <laughs> That's how guys see it. Watch. A guy can have their arm hanging off by a little thread of tissue, right? I don't care. You know, rub some dirt on it. Put a Band-Aid on it. If your junk don't work, it's flight for life. <laughs> You think I'm lying? <laughs> so anyways, um, there was another guy who came in with a really bad uh, foot ulcer. And there's, at this point, there's nothing you can do about it, right? So they had to remove it. Otherwise, the infection spreads. And you become septic, you die. So that day, the surgeon was to come in and mark the foot, right? Well, he marked the wrong foot. So he cut off the wrong foot. So he had to go back to surgery and go get the other foot cut off because it needed to come off. That guy went to court, sued, yeah. and got nothing. Why? Not a dime. Why? He didn't have a leg to stand on. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hate me too. Watch. This is diabetic retinopathy. Right? What did I tell you? It affects small microvascular disease. So what will happen is these little arteries, the retinal arteries that supply your retina, they will rupture. So diabetics will start getting like these blank dark spots in their field of vision. And then ultimately they will go completely blind. They can take all the laser though and go in their eye and They can. Bleeding. That's really, it's kind of temporary. It ultimately, what's going to happen is these people are going to become blind. So basically what happens in diabetes is you rot from the outside in. Oh. The other thing that happens is you get kidney damage. The thickening of the glomerulus, which is basically one capillary membrane thick, causes the kidneys to um, fail. And then the glomerulus basically falls apart and you start dumping albumin and protein into your urine. Because remember, albumin is only supposed to be in your blood. Right. And that's a sign of uh, kidney failure. So if you go to that little dialysis clinic on uh, Highway 11 there, 80% of those people are diabetic, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. Say, so, yeah. How many people followed that? How many functions of insulin? Seven. Seven. I want them all. Tell me you got that. All right. Can I, can I show you something else? And then you can ambulate home today, okay? Do me, I'm, look. Come Tuesday, after I hand back the quiz and everything, you with me? We're gonna start hitting this heavy. If you didn't watch those videos, right? You need to watch the functions of insulin, right? I'm gonna show you. Okay, watch. Functions of insulin, metabolism part one and part two, functions of glucagon, say yeah, mm -hmm. and then epinephrine and metabolism. You don't have to like crazy study them unless you want to, but I, what I'm telling you is you need to watch those. All of, I have, well, listen up, every question 
on quiz number two has a video for it. A specific video. Say yeah. yeah. No excuse. All right. I'm going to show you one more thing and then you can ambulate home. Ready? That's nice. You know what I always do? I always eat in bed. And then I get the hiccups. Then one time, just real quick. You know how you don't think real good when you wake up in the middle of the night? So anyways, I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm like, I'm kind of hungry. So I look in the fridge, there's like nothing there. So I grab a bagel. Just a dry, plain bagel. And then I'm thinking to myself, this is kind of dry. So I get a glass of orange juice, right? And I'm like, I'm kind of tired. So I said, I'm just going to lay down. And I thought, I can balance that orange juice on my mattress. <laughs> the next thing I know, I wake up and I got this hunk of bagel hanging out of my mouth. And then I feel this wet spot and I'm like, I didn't. My first thought was I peed the bed, right? And then I remember I spilled orange juice. I'm like, I got one of those Sealy Tempur-Pedic, right? It was like 1800 bucks, And I didn't have a pad on it. So I had to get rid of it. Right, that was like three years ago. What am I going to do? Go find that thing? But watch. Watch. And then my girl, she gets so pissed at me when she comes over, right? And like I ate in bed. And then she goes, you ate in bed again, huh? And I'm like, look, there ain't a girl there. What are you complaining about? Who eats in bed here? Anybody? Yeah, there you go. See? One other person. Yeah. Isabel, you're getting extra credit, just so you know. <laughs> Brittany, do you eat in bed? You're getting extra credit, too. There you go. Okay, listen up, because this is true. I'm going to explain something to you. What's the hormone, or hormone, what's the protein inside a red blood cell? Oh, God. Hemoglo red blood cell. Hemoglobin. You got me? What's the goal of the body? That's good. Watch. Listen up. This is true. Your blood sugar should never, ever, ever get above 180. Ever. Do you know why? Because you have insulin. Say yeah. But diabetics, their blood sugar routinely goes above 180. Are you with me? What's the only thing that can affect pH? Free-floating free hydrogen ions. The only thing that it can affect blood sugar is free-floating glucose. Tell me you got that. So when your blood sugar starts going above 180, and it does that if you're a diabetic, say yes, yes. then that excess glucose starts binding to hemoglobin. And it binds specifically to a chain on the hemoglobin called the, well, sum it up. What the hell is that? The A1C chain. So watch. If your blood sugar is greater than 180, you get excess amounts of glucose binding to the A1C chain on hemoglobin. Are you with me? The more glucose that's bound there, the higher your blood sugar's been. How long do red blood cells live? 21 days? 120 days. The only thing you'll ever remember from this class. So. The reason doctors tell diabetics to take their blood sugar every day is to just look for real highs or real lows. The doctor doesn't care that your blood sugar was 121 on Thursday because that ain't going to kill you. They just want to see highs and lows. They treat the A1C, the hemoglobin A1C. Are you with me? So what do people do? They lie. Yes. So. 
They go in to see their doctor, their diabetic doctor, every three months, and the doctor says, well, have you been good? Oh, yeah, doc, I've been reading the textbook, and I lift up rocks, and I eat the grubs underneath there and barks off the trees. And my, I test my blood sugar like five times a day, and it's always 100. So people, before they go in when the doctor's office, they'll make up numbers in the book. Yeah. I've seen them. And the doctor goes, oh, that's good, that's good. And doctors know you lie. So they draw the A1C test that looks at your blood sugar over a three-month period. And that's the lie detector test. And that's what they treat. Tell me you got that. I get it. Mm -hmm. But what, let's say they want your A1C to be about 7 or 6. Yes. What if it's like 10? Does right. You know what that means? Your average blood sugar throughout the day for the last three months has been over 300. That's what it means. The higher the A1C, the but worse control. Like well, you, you then they're, they're doing something wrong. They need new medication or they need to read the textbook. Oh, well. Yeah. How many people followed that? That's the hemoglobin A1C test. You know who will explain that to you? No. You think I'm lying. Wait. Get in the clinical. Right? Now you know. The education continues. Ambulate home. Guys? Don't disappoint me come Thursday. Or yourself, more importantly. Are you doing anything around here for a little bit? Yeah. I'm yeah, I know I'm I'm here until nine o'clock. Yeah, nobody cares. They just keep sending me emails.